Welcome to Duck Season Somewhere podcast. This episode is brought to you by the following sponsors. For 365 days a year, it's Duck Season Somewhere at RamseyRussell'sGetDucks.com. The world of duck hunting is way bigger than our backyard. The very best duck hunts in Argentina and Mexico are only the beginning. We specialize exclusively in six continents worth of proven waterfowl hunting adventures. Whether you're looking for a unicorn species or a fun trigger pulling vacation of epic proportion, we've got the right hunt dialed in. Real duck hunts and authentic experiences for serious duck hunters. As a genuine American duck hunter myself, I know the difference. Founded in 2003, GetDucks.com is not just what we do, it's all we do. I've been there personally many times. Our reputation speaks for itself. Anita and I are personally available to assist before, during, and after your trip because you deserve nothing less. Looking for something closer to home? The next great hunt is closer than you think. Contact proven operators throughout the U.S. and Canada at our U.S. hunt list. Explore worldwide duck hunting at GetDucks.com. All package details, photos, videos, stories, and thousands of client testimonials right there at your fingertips. GetDucks.com. Ball Shot Shell's copper-plated bismuth tin alloy is the good old days again. Steel shots come a long way in the past 30 years, but will never, ever be like good old-fashioned lead. No way. Say goodbye to all the gimmicky, high-recoil compensation science and marketing hype, and hello to superior performance. Know your pattern. Take ethical shots. Make clean kills. That is the boss way. The good old days are now. It really is duck season somewhere for 365 days per year. Duck season somewhere takes me year-round to worldwide destinations where I visit with the most interesting people. I'm your host, Ramsey Russell. Join me here to listen to those conversations. Y'all imagine the Wild West. Just close your eyes and imagine the Wild West. And I mean dances with bulls, cowboys, and Indians. Wild West. Covered wagons crawling like ants down the Oregon Trail. Westward bound. These little schooners, you know, in a, in a sailing across the prairie in an ocean of short grass prairie. Red rock monuments and purple mountains in the background. Now just imagine hunting there back then and imagine hunting there now where where the landscape and the land has hardly changed at all i'm talking spectacular hunts for the rock stars of north america mallards and canada geese how y'all like that idea huh well today's guest jj randolph wild brassica out in wyoming parts of nebraska uh, they are, Wild Brassica is a part of our U.S. Hunt List team, and I'd like to introduce y'all to J.J. Randolph. How are you, J.J.? I'm good, Ramsey. Good morning. Yes, sir. It is a good morning. I tell you what, it's a beautiful morning. What's the weather like out in Wyoming today? You know, I'm going to be honest with you. It's a beautiful Wyoming day. It's about 70 degrees, partly cloudy, and uh I'm sitting at the golf course. When we get done with this conversation, I'm going to go play a little golf. So I'm not hey, complaining. I'm here. <laughs> hey, just, just to catch up, because it's been a while since we talked. Since when I talked to you last, the world was, quote, normal. And yeah. now this whole pandemic, how how has Wyoming, I mean, cowboy country out in the, the wild west and wide open, how, how have y'all been hit by this stuff? Has it, has it changed uh-huh. anything? You know, it has. I mean, we're like everybody else. We've had, uh, you know, um, you know, not locked down or whatever, but, you know, all the restaurants are closed, you know, and that kind of stuff. And we don't have as many cases as other parts of the country. But, of course, we don't have very much population either, you know. So, um, but it's uh, my wife has been working every day. She, uh, you know, been wearing a mask and all that kind of stuff. And, Sounds like things are maybe getting ready to take a turn and start opening back up, but it's been okay for us in Wyoming. We've been, I'm supposed to be guiding fishermen this month and of course haven't had much work, but guess what? I've been doing a lot of fishing with my wife and my son and my friends and we're making the most of it. You know, good thing, uh, 
I've been a waterfall guide for 30 years because I've learned to not get upset about things I can't control. <laughs> oh, boy, ain't that, you've got to be that way to be a waterfowl guide or a duck hunter today. You just let it go, yeah. man. Control what's control yeah, the controllables. When, when right. did you, uh, JJ, tell me a little bit about yourself. When did you personally start duck hunting, and what were some of your influences? How did you get into this? You know, Ramsey, Michael Kaler, who is my stepfather, you've met him. He handles all my reservations and that kind of stuff and our marketing and stuff like that. Uh, was an avid, passionate duck hunter, goose hunter, you know, as I was growing up as a small child. And I guess as early as seven, eight years old, he started taking me to the blind. And honest to God, and, you know, I'm not making this up. For me, it was one of those things that I was like, man, this is it. I don't, you know, I love duck hunting. In fact, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making this stuff up. I dressed up as a duck hunting guide for Halloween when I was like eight, nine, ten, eleven years old. <laughs> Every year, I dress up in waders and go trick or treating as a duck hunting guide. <laughs> I got I got in trouble in high school on, on numerous occasions for skipping school and going duck hunting. And I can remember having a conversation with my parents where they were chewing my butt about skipping school. And I honestly God said to them, you guys, I'm going to school. I went duck hunting today. I'm going to be a duck hunting guide. And my dad, Michael, my stepfather, who, like I said, now does my marketing and bookings, literally looked at me and said to me, Jason, you will never make a living as a duck hunting guide. You've got to do something for a job. Well, guess what? He now handles all my reservations. And he now works that. for you. <laughs> yeah, that works for me. So that's how that came about. And I grew up hunting with Michael, and uh, we hunted on the Platte River west of Omaha a lot. We hunted all over the state of Nebraska. We had a flying boat that we took. So, oh, man, we had so many different reservoirs and places in Nebraska with that flying boat. And we hunted a lot on the Missouri River on the Nebraska-South Dakota border, and I got to hunt with some guys. I got to hunt with Dick Schultz, who is a world champion uh, duck caller. I got to hunt with Wendell Carlson, who makes world champion duck calls. Uh, Spencer Brooks is a guy who taught uh, me how to duck call and taught some world champions how to duck call. And these guys were all my my influences and some of the guys I hunted on the Platte River west of Omaha with, with, with my dad, John Allen, and some other guys. And... Uh, Spencer Brooks came over to our house every Wednesday night for about two years and gave us, we all met there and got duck calling lessons from him. And that passion just grew. And <clears throat> that's, that's kind of where, where the love of it all, you know, happened for me, I guess. Oh, hey man, that's a heck of a, that's a heck of a foundation right there, JJ. You know, yeah. so, so you've been hunting the North Platte River your whole mm -hmm. life. Yeah, I have. Yeah. How, how did you end up? How did you end up in Torrington, Wyoming? That, 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 that's kind of the headquarters of where y'all are. Uh, further up, yeah. There. How, yeah. how did you end up in that little cowboy town to run this operation? Well, so I I went to college for a little bit. I had a real good time in college, but I didn't learn too much. <laughs> I was doing a little too much, <laughs> duck, a little too much duck and pheasant hunting even then, and not going to class like I should have been. So after a year of that, I said, "Well, I'm wasting mom and dad's money here. I better move on to something else." And I moved out to Utah. I got a job as a golf professional out there. I grew up playing golf and so got a job as a golf pro but i wasn't very happy doing that and a couple of years into it i said i you know i want to start i want to be a guy and uh i went out in uh eastern utah i leased some cornfields out there and i started a small small guide service where i'd have guys come out basically i just getting enough money to afford to go out there and go hunting and I loved working my dogs and training my Labradors so much. I needed guys to come and shoot birds for my dogs. So <laughs> that kind of got me into guiding too. I said, I need more hunters. I got to get more retrieves, you know? So I got guys coming. And after a bit, 
I started guiding fishing um, for a place in Park City, Utah in the summertime. And that led into me going to guide fishing at an Orvis endorsed lodge in northeast Utah called Falcon's Ledge. From there, I did all their wing shooting and fly fishing for them. And one day, some of those clients said, hey, we've heard about this uh, snow goose hunt in uh, Nebraska that this guy does. And, um, you know, would you book a hunt? We'll take you with. So I booked this snow hunt goose hunt. We did that. That was great. The guy who I guided snow goose hunts there, Dave Beam was his name, also did North Dakota in the fall. We struck up a good relationship on that trip, and he said, I would love it if you would come to North Dakota this fall and guide for me. Well, I said, okay. So I went to North Dakota, started guiding for Dave. That ended up, I ended up guiding in North Dakota for about 15 years for a few different outfitters and stuff like that. Okay. During this time, Ramsey, I guided for multiple different outfitters, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, Wyoming, Utah, multiple different guys. And to be honest with you, every time I went and worked for one of these other guys, they were either half outlaws or half drunk or and they never seemed to run a very good business. And I always said, God dang it. I can do this better myself. So yeah. one day, you know, one day I decided the last guy I was working for was paying me like nothing. And I was working from midnight to, you know, 11 o'clock getting two hours of sleep. And I went and asked him for a raise and he looked at me and said, JJ, he said, I could find any high school kid will do this job for 50 bucks a day. And I looked at him, I said, well, you better go get looking for those high school kids. And I, walked, <laughs> and I walked out of there and I said, never again. I said, I'm opening my own business. Well, I grew up hunting with Michael, my stepdad out there in western Nebraska on the North Platte um, and some different areas out there. And I knew, and I'm from Nebraska, I grew up there. I said, that's, that's where I want to be. And so I went to western Nebraska and I started looking for leases. And they were really expensive, and I didn't find any. And I rolled into Wyoming, and, man, the birds there, when I, I went and scouted around for a few days, and I thought, my God, look at all these birds, you know. I mean, there were just birds everywhere. And I got to knocking on some doors, and people were so friendly. And, you know, this one guy said, yeah, man, I'll lease you a field. And I got one field there, and that was kind of how, I got started in the area. I had some clients from I gathered over the years that immediately said, Hey, we'll come hunt with you in Wyoming. And I had one blind out there the first two years and I got guys to come out and start hunting with me. And, uh, then it kind of blossoms from there. Uh, I met a guy named Tom Harp street. who was a big farmer in the area. And, um, he and I built a very good friendship and he started i leased his land from him and then i had more land and more hunters and and then it grew from there one one of the great things i've noticed you know you're you're able to talk about a lot of your associations a lot of landowners about you know the towns and locations it's because uh it's not freelance country i mean you've got you've got these what i saw when forrest and i were out there you've got these really nice flyways under lock and key i mean you've got good long-term relationships it's private property you're not worried about somebody coming in big white trailer showing up from out east and knocking on doors and taking over the country are you i mean that that country's locked up isn't it yeah it really is it is all uh if you don't have some leases or own some land or grandpa owns some land we do have a few public areas around there that the public can go but uh cash to go around and scout oh look at the geese landing in that field let's go knock on that guy's door and see mm-hmm. if he'll let us hunt that just doesn't happen out no. in the part of the country anymore Do, no I, I i grew up as a duck hunter down here in the deep south and you know i've, I've heard a lot about the north platte river and yeah. it, it took coming out there and spending a few days you know jake latondras and Forrest and i came out and visited, yeah uh, Mr. john the monaco we had a great hunt but, you yeah. know, it, it's just being there is when I really learned the, the magic of it all. That North Platte River starts in Colorado up on one of the highest peaks. And 
snow melt, it comes in, it starts running, it goes a little bit north, runs through your area, it, it goes all the way through Nebraska. It, it eventually, the North Platte and South Platte River turn into the Platte River, turns into the Missouri River. And it was just amazing to me that all that water ends up coming right down here through Vicksburg, Mississippi at some point in time. It, it's in the upper reaches of the Mississippi Flyway. But y'all are catching a lot of central flyway stuff. But, but JJ, uh, let's talk about the North Platte River in your area because there is a, there are reasons plural that that is such a productive area. Uh, yeah. could, could you talk a little bit more about that habitat or that resource in your area? Yeah, I can. And, and, uh, you're right that, you know, the North Platte comes off the north slope of the Rockies. It runs north. And it goes up around Casper, which actually is where I am right now, because this area, as it comes north off the Rockies and runs, it makes a big horseshoe around Casper, Wyoming, and goes back south. But this area, when you're above, um, you know, Glendale Reservoir or whatever, is all, it's world-class, world-famous trout fishing, which people, a lot of people, you know, duck hunters don't know, but it is unbelievable trout fishing and as you come through this area there's pretty good duck and goose hunting here too now what it lacks the agriculture in this area there's no corn right. field you know there's a few alfalfa field, but there isn't anything to hold the ducks here once they get here but there are a lot that migrate down through here so if you're out on the right day those migration days you're going to have good duck hunting on this part of the river too but as it goes south now and it gets down to where i am that uh torrington river valley or uh the you know north Platte river valley down there then all of a sudden agriculture takes over now we've got feedlots corn fields wheat fields winter wheat um all those crops that hold mallards and canada geese now on top of it there when you get down around that north Platte river and it runs and i'm talking from you know, in Wyoming there, all the way across the Lake McConaughey and even on the other side of Lake McConaughey, along that North Platte River Valley, besides the river and all the feed that the ducks have, you can't believe how many warm water creeks there are. Now, these right. warm water creeks, they just bubble up out of the ground at like 50 degrees and run 48, 50 degrees year round okay so in the dead of winter we're in january and it's 10 below and the river slushes up and the lakes are frozen we got all these warm water creeks that the ducks just pile onto you know and that will keep them there even when it gets you know terribly cold you know we'll keep the, and it gets terribly it can get terribly cold in wyoming right it sure can and it can be warm too you know i mean we got kind of a weird little you know, we're like the banana belt down there, which is another reason why the birds hold there. We do get cold. We do get snow, but it doesn't last long. You know, it'll be a week or so, and then you'll it'll warm back up into the 40s again. And, and that keeps the birds on the toes, too. You know, go from the warm water creeks now back to the river, you know, that kind of stuff. The other thing that helps our area is the amount of refuges. We've got a couple of state-operated refuges that are big lakes. Um, that hold the birds, you know, you got to have a place for those birds to roost or otherwise oh, yeah. they, or they leave, you know, um, people bad mouth refuges. Sometimes hunters do because oh, all the birds are going in the refuge. Well, they wouldn't even be there if it wasn't for that refuge. So sometimes you're going to have those days, but when, as soon as you get a storm or some kind of weather, you got the birds there, you're going to have good hunting, you know? So we've got a couple of different refuges and we've got a six mile section of river, uh, the North Platte river that is reserve. Also, that's a landowner agreement where the landowners have all gotten together over the years and said, we're not going to let anybody hunt down here. And it's become reserve and it holds, Oh, I mean, it'll hold, I've seen a hundred thousand ducks on that reserve and I've seen 50,000 geese, I would say, you know, just a normal average year, you're going to have, you know, 50,000 mallards and uh, 20,000 geese down there, you know, and that's just on that reserve, not the other parts of the county. And as you go down into Nebraska, it's the same way. There's a few different spots down there that are reserved. Um, and those spots, the birds find them, and those are the roosts. 
and yep, you can't shoot them on a roost, but you and I kind of talked about earlier, you'll notice that ye- yes, I do have some blinds on the river. I do have quite a few warm water creek blinds, but I got a lot of cornfield blinds and some ponds also that are off of those rivers. You know, the birds roost on that, and then when they come out to feed, we get them in the cornfields, we get them on these ponds, um, and that kind of place. So we don't always hunt the river just because we want that to hold the birds, you know. That was that was that was a very impressive uh revelation when we came out there and hunted with you. Golly, that was awesome. That, you know, when I think of hunting the North Platte River, I think as a duck hunter from the south, it's hunting on or in the North Platte River, knee deep in the water, on the edge of a blind, something like that, on the river. And and that's what, that you know, it's just, it was hard for me. I, I, I'm aware of state and federal sanctuaries. They're needed. Ducks and geese need somewhere they can go without getting shot at. But, man, right there where, where, where we were hunting, that that's a substantial co-op by private landowners committed to providing that resource of, of sanctuary and violate sanctuary for a waterfowl. And those, yeah, those, really those, those, are, those are landowners, as I envisioned it, those are landowners just sitting around at the coffee shop saying, hey, you know what? We ought to just get together and, and put our properties together along this river and not let yeah. anybody shoot it as a, as a great habitat for ducks. Is that right? I mean, these, these landowners... That is- Got yeah. together and set it aside for the resource. Yeah, that is basically it. There was a guy named George Rakestraw back in the, oh, I think late 70s that kind of got this whole thing going and trying to boost our Canada goose population around there, which he did a tremendous job, <laughs> by the way. But uh, hey, but he kind of brought all that up, and he got the, a couple of those refuges put in place, and I think he started that conversation with those landowners and then yeah basically you're right and you've been in our coffee shop <laughs> you could see oh yeah you, know, you could see how that could happen you know so and and you know what i got to tell you is it's a godsend because this is what a lot of people don't realize is we all love to hunt and all that kind of stuff but what it does for the community people don't understand i mean i got 25 30 guys in that breakfast cafe every morning and she might not have that business without me we got guys staying in the hotels filling up the gas stations going out restaurant eat every night that that none of that would have happened without the reserves and the birds to be there mm-hmm. you don't have those refuges you don't have those birds those people aren't eating in that coffee shop blah 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 so there is you know what they did was Probably didn't know at the time what they were doing, but it's pretty amazing, you know. No, it's got a far-reaching effect beyond just the hunters and the ducks. That's that's a great point, JJ. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about uh, the hunt itself because it, it we were uh, we hunted a couple of different areas uh, out of your pit blinds, but it, it was it was in the traffic. It was coming from those sanctuaries or from that landowner co-op to different areas, and we were kind of running traffic. And uh, it was, it was I wouldn't, you know, from Mississippi, boy, I wouldn't call it warm when we hunted yeah. there, but it wasn't as cold as it could get. I mean, it, it was windy yeah. and uh, just typical high plains hunting. But um, t- talk a little bit about those Canada geese because, you know, uh, I did a little research, and that's what old Frank Bellrose would have called the uh, the highland population of Canada geese. It was, I mean, it, and it was a mixture of small, large, and medium sized geese. Yeah, that, that were uh, is that is that pretty normal? A pretty good normal yeah, mix that, of all those different races of Canada geese coming through. Yeah, our little geese, you know, uh, <laughs> and I don't know what you you know they what you call them lessers or cacklers or, you know, and it's hard to discriminate between all the subspecies or whatever, but little geese, our little geese come through first, come through earliest. They'll show up mid November. If, uh, you know, Canada gets weather and that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, our goose season usually opens up like, Oh, around the 20th of November. And I would say when we're shooting those early geese, a lot of them are those little geese. And boy, they decoy great for about two weeks, and then they get pretty tough for us. Oh yeah, 
and then we're all the guys are sitting here going, okay, bring on the big boys. We can talk to the big boys, you know? And, uh, and then, so later in the season, usually first, second week of December, uh, we, you know, I watch Montana's weather. Now our, my birds come down, they go down that Bighorn, Yellowstone, Missouri, uh, all those Montana rivers, and they hold up there until they get weather there, and then they'll come down to me. So I watch Montana. I look at Billings forecast and other places around there, and as soon as I see them getting cold, and mainly snow, not so much cold, but snow, you got to cover up the feed to move those big geese and those late season mallards. It can be as cold. You can freeze up all the water. I don't care. They'll still find some to eat. You got to have snow. So they get eight inches of snow or more. I say, boys, look out. Here they come. And those birds come come down to us. And so we get those bigger geese second week of December, and then we've got them all the way to February. Now, if it's a cold year, the little geese, they kind of move out in the middle of the season, like December, mid-December to mid to late January. You don't see as many little geese, but the reverse migration will start about the end of January, and my goose season goes till mid-February, and so we get a couple of weeks of hunting those little guys when they come back as ah. well. So, so we got kind of... I would, the big ones are our bread and butter because for us, they're, they decoy the best. Um, and, uh, you know, you can really talk to them with a call and, and that's kind of our bread and butter, but those little ones, when they do it, uh, they're pretty fun, but we do get a little frustrated with them. If they're still around middle of the season, by then they're so dang smart. It's like, Oh gosh, you know, here comes some more of those little ones. Oh, yeah, they're, that's, <laughs> most of the, most of the big ones, uh, according to bell Rose, are, or a mixture of the giants and predominantly the western. Same things that would be Utah and, and you know, not yeah. the true giants, but big ones. And then, uh, you know, we did yeah. shoot. I do remember shooting a few ducks. It was it was not snowy. It was not it was it was cold, but not particularly cold. It was warm during the day, and we shot a few mallards out in the field. But mostly we shot mallards uh, on a tank you had over here, some water where the birds were coming in to, to load yeah. and, and do some stuff midday. But you had explained that there are times like like during uh, snow snowy weather and that, that'll make those birds uh, want to hit that high carbohydrate corn that, that you do shoot mallards sometimes in the fields. Is that right? Buddy, we shoot a lot of mallards in the fields. We really do. Just about, it, it, it absolutely 100% has to be snowing if we get snow just about every time those mallards will come out and hit those and hit those fields now you know i'm trying to think like a duck whether they think oh our food is going to get covered up we better get out there and get it now or what they think but you get any kind of snow and then if we get a good snow and the snow stays on the ground for a few days as long as we've got snow on the ground those mallards seem to come out and hit those fields every day now during those times if the mallards are hitting the field i can leave my ponds alone and my warm water creeks alone and my river spots alone and let those birds roost there and i've got all the cornfields leased right around there and those birds come off and into those cornfields and we get our limit in the cornfields and never touch the roost and you can really try and milk it that way you know for as long as you can until the snow melts again and the birds go back to doing what they were before but if we get some weather like that the man, it's unbelievable mallard hunting in fact my guides will tell you I, we had a big conversation this year about you know you get those days you got to be careful not to shoot into those big flocks because we've got a whole season of hunters to run and we, and you don't want to burn the birds. And so we'll have flocks of mallards, 500, a thousand, even 1500, all of a sudden just boom, come into those cornfields on you right off that refuge. And you just got to say, you know, I'm sorry guys, but we're going to watch the show here. There's no, we're only going to kill three ducks out of this flock. There's no reason shooting into a thousand and, and let them go until you get the smaller bunches in. Right. <laughs> when it's good and it's a snowstorm and you can be picky like that, you know, and so it works. Well, you're always, uh, you're always busy with clients. Y'all stay full out there. And, uh, I, I really end up talking to Michael. I, I, I yeah. talk to Michael a whole lot more than I talk to you. And, uh, he, he talks about 
he said, Ramsey, you didn't see nothing when you were out here. He said, wait until it gets right. Because uh, he was talking about the 410 and 28 gauge hunts. And, and as I understood it, I don't think he shoots a 12 gauge or even I was the one to hear him talk. But I mean, yeah, there are times when, when those conditions hit, when that weather hits magical that y'all are literally running 410 and 28 gauge hunts. Those geese are coming so close, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. When it's when it's good, you know, my pit blinds, you were in them, are really camouflaged. Uh, you know, they're they're ground level, buried. They're uh, eight foot wide by sixteen foot long. They'll hold five hunters, and I got a dog box on the end. So a dog and five hunters fit in there comfortably. We've got heaters. Uh, four or five different heaters hanging on the back wall, propane heaters, and everybody's nice and toasty. But I've got this great lid system that slides right over the top of you, uh, and you've got a camouflage net on it, and you're looking. You can see pretty good right through that camouflage net, and everybody can you got a rotating bar stool. You can spin around as the birds are circling and watch these birds and watch them, and which is great because that's the whole thing is watching the birds work. But because you're camouflage pit line, those I mean, when they do it and conditions are right, I mean, they'll shoot. They try to land right on top of the blind sometimes. They do not see those blinds, and so uh, because of that, we can get some close shooting. So I, well, I got a group from Minnesota comes out. They've been coming, God bless them, 10 years or so now. They are crack shots. They they spend all summer sporting clays tournaments. It's two women and two men, and they spend all summer doing sporting clays, trap tournaments, all this stuff. They come every year. They bring nothing but 410 and 28 gauges. And we had one year, two years ago, three days in a row, killed our limit of mallards, and our limited geese with nothing but 410 and 28 gauge three days in a row. And uh, wow. it's really spectacular. Now, they are crack shots, and that helps, but it's fun when the birds are working like that. Well, well, I've got a 28 gauge. Ball Shot Shells has started making some good 28 gauge yeah. loads, and, and I fully intend to bring a 28 gauge next time I hunt with you. But speaking of those pit blinds, now look, Michael tried to describe to me uh, before we showed up how these pit blinds were. When I think of pit, pit blinds, I think of metal blinds uh, stuck out in a rice field or something like that. Uh, y'all blinds, you, that was by far the most comfortable blind situation, hunting situation I had ever been into. We show up, crack of dawn, the wind's blowing, it's cold, and uh, you jump down, you know, a lot of your decoys were in the blind somewhere in the trailer. You, you grab the decoys out real quick. You jump down in the hole. You did something. You pop, turned on the heat. You pop back yeah. out. We we put up the, the decoys like you wanted. It took, I'm going to say, start to finish five, ten minutes to put out that spread. And when we climbed off into that blind, it was, it was, it was 16 feet long, eight feet wide. It was like crawling into a little cabin. It's built of, <laughs> of thick lumber. You know what I'm yep. saying? It, 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 it's warm. You've got these nice professional office chairs that revolve around. I can lean back. I can look up. Your slides were not cumbersome. I can look through. Everybody down there can watch the geese start to spin. You can watch them respond. You can do everything. And when the shot is called, it's just it's just push the top back, boom, up come the yep. guns. But it was it was the kind of blind that, that if you know if, if if you're waiting out the ducks and geese, because like that morning we hunted, those geese were coming off the roost. We got a little action. They continued west to go feed. And like, no, 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 we got to wait on them to come back. You could wait it out. You could talk comfortably. I could not wear a coat. At the time of year I was there, with those heaters rolling, I could not wear a coat or, or bib. I, I mean, we just had to get basically undressed. It was so It's like sitting in my den. It was so comfortable sitting at the office one day on a cold winter day. You know, it, it, I'm glad you it liked it. Oh, I loved it. I, I'm telling you, I loved it. It was, it was, it was amazing, honey. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know, here's the thing is, you know, I got these people fishing in the spring and it's a rainstorm and it's windy out there. And I say, God, you guys are nuts. It's freezing out here. You sure you want to fish in this? And they look at me and they say, well, you're a duck and goose hunter you got to be freezing all the time. And I said, oh, no, that's not necessary. You know, you can do it. And, oh, uh, boy. Still be, 
still be warm and comfortable. And I'll tell you, you know, one thing that I wanted to do with this with this business that I feel like sometimes everybody else isn't doing is a high level of customer service. And I want to be able to take care of a handicapped person, an old person, a little kid, um, what whatever it may be. And those blinds do that. And the fact that I don't have a blind that I can't drive a pickup truck or minimum a four wheeler, but at least most of them a pickup truck right up to and unload that guy. So if we've got an older gentleman or somebody with a disability or whatever, I mean, we drive five feet from the blind, unload them, get them in there, get the heater going. Everybody's nice and comfortable. And uh, it just makes it a more enjoyable day. And then, like you say, it doesn't matter what the weather's like, you could stay out there because we all know the crappier the weather, the better the hunting. (laughs) Oh, boy. Yeah. It, it was uh, it was it was the most Cadillac blind yeah. I've ever been to. JJ, did, speaking of which, did you did you design those yourself, or, or did you come up with some plans? I mean, how how did I that... did that? I I talked just a little bit earlier. I mentioned my friend Tom Hart Street, and I got to tell you, this guy, he, he, God bless him. I, I wouldn't be where I am without him. He designed that blind. He was my hunting partner. I met him. Torrington's got this hunt called the Two Shot Goose Hunt. It's a big charity done for the community every year. A charity hunt. The governor comes. They always have a celebrity. Uh, Tim Grounds used to come to it and some other guys and stuff. And when I first started working in Torrington, somebody said, you got to put your pit in this Two Shot Goose Hunt. And the community will appreciate it. And plus, you'll get to go to the dinner. <laughs> you know, and I said, okay, great. And I drew this guy, Tom Harp Street, who was a, just a local guy in Torrington, a local farmer and businessman there. And I got him in my blind, and we hit it off. And after we got done hunting that day, he said, J.J., you're a pretty good goose caller. He says, uh, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> and I just starting out, I said, I'm no clients. I'm not doing anything. He says, well, I got a spot. I'd like to take you. You want to go hunting? And I said, yeah. So the next morning I met Tom at the cafe and he took me to this beautiful spot and God, we shot a limit of geese. And he said, that was great. He says, what are you doing tomorrow? I'll take you to another spot. I said, well, I'm not doing anything. He said, let's go. So the next day we went to another spot and he said, well, Hey, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> I said, I think I'm going hunting with you. <laughs> he said, yeah. So he took me to another spot. He took me to five spots. And the next five days, every one of them was an unbelievable goose spot. And at the end of it, he said, well, here's the deal. I need somebody to help me with all this stuff. And you need some stuff to lease. So if you lease it from me and just set it up so I can hunt, then that'll work for me. So that is where I got a lot of my good property. And Tom designed, though, he came up with that blind design. That was his design. Now, he has since passed away, God bless him, 10 years ago, and um, and I've kept that blind going because I think it's one of the best designs I've, you know, ever seen. I made a couple modifications, but really not not much, so i got to hand it to Tom for that blind design, and then Tom passed away 10 years ago. I'll touch on this real quick, so we do a, do a, a hunt, a youth hunt in his name every year the tom harp street memorial youth hunt and it's tom's youth and uh we have 50 kids on the last sunday of january every year that uh the community helps out i get all my goose hunting buddies in the community to donate their pits and time for the day and we take 50 kids and take them hunting for that day and we give away a bunch of prizes, we give away some shotguns people donate. We have a goose calling contest and a big banquet at the end of the day. And it's not a competition, it's just fun for the kids. And we do that in uh, in Tom's name every year. So he was a big influence on me in that in that area. That's fantastic. I've heard about that youth hunt too. Michael and I have talked about it. And that's a that's a fantastic program in the day and age that we need to get youth hunters involved. 50 kids show up for this event. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, it really is amazing, Ramsey. And you can't, uh, it's emotional for me because Tom was such a good friend. And uh, just the way the community has embraced that hunt. And uh, I'm sorry, it just, 
I miss him, you know. But um, but anyway, it was it's a great thing, and the the parents that come up to me and go, "Oh my God, my kids waited all year for this," and you know, they go, "Oh, he slept all night long in his camouflage clothing." And, <laughs> you know, was blowing that kept us all night up all night blowing the goose call. I'm so glad this day's here so we can get it over with, you know. God, <laughs> lady, boy, that that is really that's, cool. that's powerful word, but that's a heck of a tribute too. That is yeah. a heck of a tribute. Uh, thank you all for doing that, JJ. Listen, let's let's talk about let's talk about the typical program for anybody listening that might be interested in, in seeing what uh, out there. Let's talk about the typical day because for me, uh, and I think Forrest and I talked about this not too long ago. If you if you said, okay, we meet down at the cafe um, at such and such time, I realized after the first morning that I wanted to be there when they opened. But because that was that was that was a good start to a day. What was the name of that cafe? Sweet Lou's Cafe. Sweet Lou. Sweet, Sweet Lou. Lou. And yeah. and you walk in and there's 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 I don't know two dozen or more hunters from everywhere from Minnesota to California. Everybody huddled up around their table. Myself, Jay, John Lamonico, Forrest, we had our table, and. Uh, it was just what a great breakfast. It was just the atmosphere of all, all your hunters sitting yeah. in here, mixing it up. How you doing? Where are you from? Uh, boy, I tell you what, there was a guy, uh, one of the local cowboys there, Craig. I, I got yeah. a menu. He said, what do you want to eat? And I said, I don't know, three egg omelet over easy, whatever. He comes up and brings biscuits and gravy. <laughs> I said, no, I ordered egg. He goes, well, today's breakfast is, is biscuits and gravy, son. It's going to the best in town. It was just, it was hilarious. It was so much fun. You know, what a great start to the day. Yeah, it is. I'll tell you, I've been having coffee and stuff with those guys for over 20 years now. And uh, it sure is a lot of fun. And then to get the hunters in there uh, and they love it. They like talking to all you guys, you know, from different parts of the country and that kind of stuff. They all think it's pretty, pretty neat too, you know, but that's, that's how our day starts. We roll into the cafe and have breakfast there, and you can, uh, you know, hear all the town gossip and anything from corn prices to politics and you know whatever goes on in in there. And then, uh, and then we do all day. I say we do all day hunts, or until you get your limit, you know, or if, if that if that happens, and if you get your limit of geese, well, then we'll go after a limit of ducks. Or you get your limit of ducks, then we're going to go after a limit of geese. So most of the time, we'll hunt, you know, most all day, unless it's you know those fortunate times, which we do have quite often, where you know we limit out early. But uh, we'll start the day at the cafe, and then you're going to go out with your guide, whether it's you or I've got four full time guides that are just they are really awesome, and I'm glad, you know, thankful and blessed to have them because they are something else. So whether you go out with me or one of my guides, we're going to head to whatever that may be that day. Now, some guys come in and say, hey, we want ducks. We don't even care about geese. Some guys come in and say, we want geese. We don't care about ducks. And some guys come in and say, hey, we want both or, or whatever you suggest. So we're going to start out that day in – trying to go after a limit of ducks or a limit of geese. And once we get those, then the afternoon we'll be pursuing the limit that you didn't get. You know, uh, sometimes we can get ducks and geese right in the same field or same water spot or whatever it may be. Other times we're going to switch after the morning hunt, maybe go to a field in the afternoon for the ducks or whatever that may be. But, uh, go breakfast, then head to the hunt. And then, um, in the evenings, you know, there's a couple different restaurants in town that the guys go to. We got some lodging, but we don't have a lodge where we serve food and that kind of stuff. So guys go out to a different restaurant in Torrington at night, and I come make the rounds, come around, sit down, and have dinner with the. I usually go hit a couple different groups, you know, and uh, I get kind of fat during the winter time. But that's all good. I, I re- see, I really enjoyed that program. We we stayed in uh, I can't remember what y'all call it, the lodge house or the bunk house or somewhere. The bunk house, yeah. And and I wasn't. I'm gonna tell you, you know, a bunk house. Okay, so I'm expecting a cowboy tack room or something. No, 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 no. That that house was nicer than my own. It, it was a beautiful house, nice and comfortable. Uh, the 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 head, you know. Per person count was cheaper than any hotel in town. I'm guessing very comfortable. We had our own bedrooms, our own our own uh, 
our our own uh, bathrooms, whatever. It was just it was just perfect, man. It was so nice. And uh, but you know, JJ, one thing I want to point out to anybody listening is the way y'all run y'all's hunter programs through the, the way you run your group is is not um, like you were talking about the the client experience. You want to capitalize on that. It was a very unique structure because because y'all don't just take singles and whoever and whoever and put them all in a blind together like they might in other parts of the country. Y'all y'all actually do groups. It's other word in other words, uh, per day it's this much divided by one to four people usually. And and you know, so you, you, I've got I've got a flat fee of an all day pit blind, your group only. Uh one person could have it to himself or you can you can split it up among four people. And and uh boy I tell you what, talk about a timely little program that you go to speak to me about how y'all uh, client service and customer service and how y'all respond to it. You know, COVID, uh, this, this pandemic has not been uh, without its share of pain. There are a lot of people I personally know and care about that have been hurt because we've been sheltered in place, deemed non-essential, whatever. There are people who've had their their income interrupted, or or, or people that are that are really uh, they're, they're hurt, they're struggling. You know, I know yeah. some guys that are struggling with their businesses. I know some guys that are struggling with their, their household income. And so when Michael called me last month and said, hey, Ramsey, we're we're running a special this year. Um, we're going to do a, a little bit of a reduced rate, and we're going to accommodate one and two hunters instead of just four. We really, yeah. we really want to, to, you know, be on board and, and understanding of this pandemic and invite people to come out here uh, still, you know, understanding things could be tough for some people. And man, I'm going to tell you what, that is a, uh, that's a heck of a gesture. I'm going to tell you, that speaks a lot to who you and Michael are as a business that, that y'all understand that and say, you know, we invite people to come out here with smaller groups, a little bit less price, because we understand this is going to be a tough hole to climb out of for some people. That, that's yeah. big volumes about who y'all are, JJ. Well, thank you. It's, you know, it's, uh, you you can only do what you can do, you know. We try 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 our best, but that but that's a nice situation for people, and we do do it that way with a, a you know we are making a special deal for a two two person deal this year because we understand you know the situation that everyone's in, but it it is a nice deal to be able to have that blind to yourself, you know, over the years with the you know it, I've got certain expenses into it that i got to get out of it you know so for i got you got to have so much a pit otherwise it's not you know i'm doing this for free and and i'm a generous person and love people but i got a family i got to pay for so you know i gotta make a little bit you know i gotta make a little bit there but i i i don't like the I like those small groups, you know, I don't like a big group, you know, eight guys out there in a pit or anything like that. I like small group. I like everybody to know each other and get along mixing groups or let's put a single in here or whatever for me over the years has not, you know, it just hasn't, it hasn't worked too good. So I went to this quite a while ago where it's a price per pit and whether you have one people or four people, it's the same price. And you can't believe I got two brothers that come every year that are both uh, in their late seventies that, I mean, they only hunt together once a year and it's just the two of them and they come on, they get the pit themselves and come hunt for three days every year. I got a couple different husband and wives that just, you know, want to hunt the two of them. And that's great. We can accommodate that. I, I, it's more fun that way. You know, it's nice. I agree. I like, I like to mix it up. I personally like to mix it up with a lot of people. You know, at mm-hmm. times, but mm-hmm. the older I get, the more I, like, I just want to be with my people. Yeah. You know, it it, it, cha- it changes the dynamic because so much of what we, we really love, besides shooting Canada geese and shooting mountains, so much of what, you know, I've always said, you know, uh, real life happens between the volleys. You know, yeah. you're in a blind waiting out the next flight, waiting right. out the next play, and it's just, it's just, it just changes the dynamic. And I really, really like that aspect of your program now. One day, speaking speaking of non hunting type stuff, uh, I got, got to hit this high point with you. But uh, we 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 did spend a couple of days, all day more or less, in the blind. You know, uh, geese in the morning, ducks in the afternoon, 
or, or just break midday to go grab a lunch. And, uh, holy cow, I don't remember what the name of that little town was. We stopped at a Mexican. Hey, y'all like Mexican? Yeah, I like Mexican. So we go into this Mexican restaurant and, uh, and, and boy, I mean, just real authentic Wyoming Mexicans in there. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it really, I hadn't been, I hadn't experienced that kind of Mexican food outside of, uh, the, the deep South Texas or into Mexico, but, she comes up and says today's lunch special is tamales. Well, many people listening may not know this, but look, tamales are like a big Mississippi thing. I know you don't think of tamales in Mississippi, but but it, it's really kind of a big deal. There's a world champion tamale cooking contest here in Mississippi Delta, and uh, so maybe I'm a little bit of a tamale snob. And I'm just thinking to myself, she is dumb like there ain't no way. She saw the si senor, the, the the best tamales on earth are right here. And I'm like, no way. I come from Mississippi, ma'am. That that's a big order. And and I'm here to tell y'all, best hot tamales on earth are right there in that little restaurant and and, and we ate there two days in a row. We went back the two next days day. In a row. Okay. <laughs> that was that's so a, good. That is Lingle Lingle, Wyoming in that restaurant, the Lira's and they've been there I don't even did a lot longer than I have and I've been there a pretty long time, you know. Oh but, uh, boy, was that that, that was that was perfect yeah, context. Was like, okay. You know, we 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 hit that little family breakfast uh, the little family the restaurant, big Lou's for <laughs> breakfast, have a lot of fun, we'd go out and hunt just until and uh go eat hot tamales. And then at night, you know, there were several family cafes. There was one up on the hill, great yep. steaks or prime rib or whatever. I mean, it was just, it, it, it just really put uh, a full context, you know, into the whole experience about doing that. But now, one afternoon we took off. We did not hunt. I think we shot our Canada Goose Limit that morning. And because we were filming Life Short Get Ducks, we had to take a break. We wanted to go get some B-roll. We're out here in the Wild West, so let's drive over to Fort Laramie. We drove over to Fort Laramie and uh, filmed a little bit, and did some stuff, and uh, a lot of geese. We found a big goose refuge and filmed some geese, and we're coming back. And I remember coming back, and as we got outside of Torrington, um, somewhere out there, I, I remember, well, as we got to where we had been hunting, we drove right past it. There was a road sign that said something about a historical marker. The next day we were hunting, um, and I asked you about this. I said, J.J., um, What's that historical marker over there? And he said, "Oh well, it, 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 it was a important event out west, uh, the Grattan Massacre. In fact, there's a big like a headstone we can stop and see if you want." We did, and out there in the middle of one of y'all's fields, where you hunt, yeah. or, uh, the, the field to the east of us, was this big monument. I'm gonna say it's chest high and, and big, this big piece of granite that said Grattan Massacre. Right. And the story you told me about that really drove home holy cow i am right in the middle of dances with wolves wild west shooting geese in epic proportion could you could you could you tell us could you tell that story again about the Grattan massacre could you i mean that is where the cowboy uh the 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 the, the indian war started right freaking there we were killing geese right there on that point could you could yep. you say could you tell us of that story yeah, and that is, uh, so the, the Grattan monument for this battle was, uh, it, it, I leased that ground as some of the, right where it all happened is I've got a goose pit right there. In fact, a every year when we go out there to dig and put the pit in, I'm always sifting through the dirt looking for arrowheads or something, you know, but, but it happened right on our land and it's the Grattan massacre. Now the Grattan massacre, it was the first it was the the Indian. It's not a battle, but a, a whatever confrontation that started the Plains Indian Wars, which you know Crazy Horse was involved in, and Sitting Bull and Red Cloud, and all ended up coming to a head, you know, at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Well, this is what kicked it off, and this all happened right on uh, the property that I I leased from, and at the time there were and and. Don't quote me on the date here. I think it was like 1856, maybe. I, I could be pretty close on that. But at the time, right there along the North Platte River, right where we hunt, was a village of Native Americans. I've heard reports of anywhere from, you know, 500 to 1,400 Native Americans camped right along the river. Now, at that point in time, 
Indian affairs and everything was still pretty peaceful. There weren't, there hadn't been any major confrontations with the Native Americans or anything yet. And the settlers and everything are rolling through in the covered wagons. And they're going to Fort Laramie, which was a major stopover point on that trail going westward. They could stop there and get supplies and that kind of stuff. There was a guy in charge at Fort Laramie, and his name was Gratton. Uh, I can't remember. Was, he was the guy in charge anyway. So lieutenant. Now, lieutenant Gratton. Lieutenant. So the I guess it was some Mormon pioneers were going by, and one of their cows, they let, got loose, wandered into the village, whatever. They just kept going. There's this cow in the village, and uh, of course the Native Americans. I mean, hey, there's a cow. Let's eat it, you know. So they and and, they and, there, and there's there's the Mormon settler going. I'm scared of the Indians. Right. And then the Mormon settler going. I'm not going in there to get my cow because he's scared of the natives, right? And uh, so they eat the cow. Now the Mormon gets to Fort Laramie. He makes it on down the river and goes into Fort Laramie and tells Lieutenant Gratton, "Hey, those Native Americans stole my cow." What are you going to do about it? Well, the story is Lieutenant Gratton was really one of these guys wanted to make a name for himself, you know, and uh, show something. So he gathered up, I believe it was 27 soldiers, and they went down there to where these Indians were camped right on, you know, my goose lease there. He goes down there. Now, the guy who's in charge of the Native American village, his name is Conquering Bear. I don't think he was a chief, but he was a village spokesman type guy. He was the guy. Conquering Bear. Conquering Bear. So Conquering Bear goes up to talk to Grattan. Now, the story I've heard, I believe it probably to be true, is one, Grattan and his troops were pretty drunk. Whiskey was a big thing back then. Well, still is, but it sounds like they were pretty drunk. Two. They had an interpreter with them who apparently wasn't that good of an interpreter, you know, said he spoke Sioux, but as it turns out, maybe just a little bit, you know. And so they get down there and go to Conquering Bear and say, Gratton says, I want the, the Indians who are involved in eating this cow and they're coming with me to Fort Laramie where they will be put on trial. And Conquering Bear says, hey, buddy, the cow wandered in the village. We all ate some of it. I'm not going to give you those guys responsible. I'll give you some horses if you want to take if, some horses. If, if, if the white man wanted it, he'd come and got it. He obviously didn't want it. He just left it he, for us to eat. Exactly. So he says, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you some horses if you if you want that. And Grattan says, no, that won't do. And by gosh, went up on the hillside, turned around with his 27 uh, soldiers and himself, and opened fire. And the first guy they shot was Conquering Bear. Somebody, boom, shot him. Uh, they shot another Indian. So there were two Indians that were killed. Well, you got 27 guys. And like I said, the rumor I heard was either 500 to 1,400 Native Americans in the village. And they're being shot at. They, I don't know what anybody else would have done. I think I'd have done the same thing. Well, they run up the hill, and they wipe out Grattan and all his men. Well, I mean, they were under attack, you know. They were under yeah, attack. Yeah. Yep, so they go up, and they kill all his kill all his men, and that's the, the Grattan massacre. Well, word of this gets back to Washington, of course, and, of course, that doesn't go over well. We can't have Native Americans killing our guys. So this is what really kicked it off. So they got the Grattan massacre. Well, now they send General Harney out, and General Harney goes down to Blue Water Creek, which is also along the North Platte River, down by Lisco and Oshkosh, that area. Goes to Blue Water Creek. There's a village of Native Americans camped out there on Blue Water Creek. They were they had nothing to do with the Bratton Massacre, by the way. But General Harney goes in and does that terrible thing that they did back then, goes in while they're still sleeping in the tents and just like, massacres the whole village like women children everything well Bibli biblical went biblical, biblical on them. went biblical on them well that set off, that ignited that set off the whole fire and why wouldn't it have and now uh, that 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 basically started the war between the sioux and uh you know the calvary 
And like I say, ended up, and then after that, you got the Fetterman massacre, you got, you know, the Rosebud, you know, different ones, and it all escalates at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and we know what happens there. <laughs> right, right there, right there where your hunts take place. Yeah. You no, know, at that That's time, cool. at that time, the Sioux Nation, Yep. Really didn't, really didn't, really didn't have an issue. And I didn't, I never read this in a history book, but they didn't really have an issue with all those covered wagons and settlers coming through. A little bit of cultural yep. differences going on. They didn't see the future. They didn't, see, they didn't see history coming. They had no problem. They were, they were living, let live. There were plenty of bison, plenty of ducks, plenty of whatever they were, deer yep. and antelope playing on the, on the range there. And they didn't have a problem until that misunderstanding over a, a lost calf wandered off yep. in their village. And it resulted in one of the biggest uh, genocides to ever happen in America, but but it just rewrote American history. That's amazing. Yeah, you know, and, it, and, it really is. Yeah, and, uh, and but you know, me, me. Ch- changing the sub that is that is such a great story. And you know, Forrest and I, of course, pose with our geese right there by. That's a that's a great place, a little great place to pose with limbs of Canada geese. You know, like, to me it was. And uh, yeah. JJ has 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 much changed. Uh, what about are there any conservation issues or anything like that in that part of the world? Because to me, there's highways, there's roads, there's cornfields, there's there's agriculture, but so much of the landscape around there just seems so relatively unchanged to other parts of the United States from what it may have been back in those days. Do you see or uh, having a personal opinion on any? pending conservation issues or hunting issues in that part of the world? Well, I'm pretty blessed in, in our area. Um, you know, as far as doing anything more for conservation, you know, in our area, we don't nest a lot of birds. Uh, we nest some Canada geese. We don't nest a lot of ducks uh, in Wyoming. You know, they're going further north, but we do nest some Canada geese. So, you know, doing a little more nesting habitat might help, but man, things are not a whole lot different here than they were back in the days of the Grattan massacre. I mean, we've gotten a lot more agriculture, but you know what? That's good for the waterfowl. I mean, those cornfields, winter wheat fields, and that is part of the reason that our waterfowl population these days are so strong because of the abundance of food and so you know i would say that has kind of actually maybe helped a little bit and our waterfowl counts traditionally at this point in time you know are pretty high um i don't know what the exact counts were like when lewis and clark came through but today's age man these are the good old days of waterfowl and really i mean we've got you know, you can shoot five mallards and five Canada geese a day where I am. I mean, that is, uh, that's generous. I think that's an excellent limit. You know, I mean, you got, oh, sure guys, is. you got four guys out there. That's a lot of shooting when you're, you know, trying to go after both limits. And, uh, so I don't really know. There's a whole lot more in my area you could do conservation wise, other than, I'm always up for establishing more refuge. You know, that's the one thing I think holds birds. If you want to hold birds in your area, you got to have reserve. You got to have refuge. So if there were anything I personally could do, it would tie up more of the North Platte River for refuge um, than there is there already. And the problem you find with that is, Everybody likes to hunt the river, and I understand that. I like to hunt the river, too, but what you also need to understand, if you look at, like, the refuge on the river we've been talking about, buddy, if you got multiple miles of river that you can leave for reserve, you don't ever have to hunt that river because you can hunt the fields and the ponds and whatever just off of that river and leave that river alone, and you still got, you'll have more birds than you ever had before. You know, and so I guess that's about all I see in our area. And I'm not a, you know, biologist or conservation expert or anything. But to me, you know, things look pretty good where I'm at. Boy, I tell you what, JJ, that's a that's a great that's a great answer. It really is. Yeah. You know, uh, there's so few places on earth that 
seen as uh, as wild and as natural as they used to be. Yeah. And that's a that really to me uh, that really defined hunting that part of the world with you to me. It, it's just it was so natural, it was so well managed, and it was just kind of like stepping back in, into history. And I, I want to end on that note because it is such a strong note, uh, folks listening. J.J. Randolph, Wild Brassica Outfitters, U.S. Hunt List, Wyoming. Check it out. J.J., if you got any parting shots, how can people get in touch with you? Um, Wild Brassica Waterfowl is a website, Facebook, um, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. Info at wildbrassicawaterfowl.com is our email. My phone number is 435-901-3825. And uh, you can email Michael or call me or whatever. We'd love to hear from you. But Wild Bass to Waterfowl, that's how you can get in touch with us. 10-4. And I know you're fixing to go play some golf, and uh, I'm sure you'll be getting back some of that world-class trout fishing soon enough, won't you? <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, well, hopefully – the world gets up and going again here pretty soon we can get back to hunting and fishing and spending time with each other folks thank y'all for listening to duck season somewhere uh hit me up at ramsey russell get ducks check us out on instagram social media uh please rate share comment on uh on this podcast if y'all are enjoying it and as always we'd love to hear what y'all would like to hear in future episodes thank you again Duck Season Somewhere is produced by Ben Page. Original soundtrack by our friend Cody Huggins.